So yeah, I wanted to talk a bit about some higher level stuff yeah. that uh, I've been experiencing and trying to condense <sighs> over 25 years of trying to write fast code. And I try to, uh, to, to give more of an overall feeling than command line things or code examples or things that, that, that are very concrete, but more of a higher level view of my experiences um, and what I've, uh, I've tried to, uh, to pick up. So uh, first of all, I love Florence. Uh, I was here when I was uh, 18 years old. That's a lot of years ago. Um, and uh, it's uh, always fascinating to be back. One of the things I, uh, I remember from, uh, from back then was that we had uh, to, to read a bit about Florence and uh, what has been going on here before we, uh, we got here. And uh, we had to read like, if you know the Divine Comedy, we had to read like a, a small excerpt of, of that. Uh, we also read a, 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 another classical story um, that is, uh, is uh, called uh, Decameron. And uh, which is a story about 10 people that uh, escape Florence uh, to escape the, uh, the Black Plague, which uh, is, uh, is happening. They end up at a monastery, as far as I recall. And they uh, decide that each of them should, uh, should tell a story um, uh, to get the time going. And, uh, and uh, so what they do is they sit, sit around and they, uh, they tell each other uh, some funny and uh, actually quite entertaining small uh, stories about uh, about uh, yeah life and and how uh, uh, funny things and and uh, slightly naughty things and uh, things that are that are that are that are going on. So one of the things that made me relate to this is that our stories are pretty linear when we tell them. So, so uh, we, when we tell a story, we tell this happened, this happened. And uh, yeah, we, everything we do is, is building a narrative of cause and effect. And, uh, and basically this happened, then, then this happened, this happened, this happened. That is how we tell stories to each other. Um, so it's, it's uh, it's pretty, pretty linear, right? That's, that's how our brains work when we want to explain something to, uh, to, to each other. Um, of course, we all uh, know about parallel plot lines like uh, we have in Game of Thrones where we have maybe five different uh, things going on at the same time. But that is, uh, is pretty much how we, uh, the limit of, of what we go to, like, like we don't tell a hundred stories overlapping because nobody can can really uh, can really keep that in their mind, uh, and that's also why when we describe something, uh, typically it's flow charts. So we have this going to this, going to this, going to this. Then this happens. It goes back up there, or it goes back down there. So it's it's a pretty common way of describing things. CPUs also have uh, parallel plot lines, <laughs> so to speak, and th that is not something completely new. It's something that's developed ever since the, uh, the 90s. It, it has slowly become more and more of these parallel plot lines. So you have uh, various things that goes on inside a uh, a CPU, you have uh, basically a pipeline that lines up instructions that are, that are, that are meant to be executed. Um, that, is quite, that is basically any CPU. Uh, even going back to the, to the very old ones, they have typically a few steps to, uh, to execute it. Um, you have branch prediction, which tries to predict what is going to, uh, to happen in the the story we, <laughs> we are telling. And, and uh, it, it basically tries to combine 
all the stuff that is going on into a single linear experience for the CPU. No, it's a bit stretched. <laughs> uh, you even have uh, out of order execution that which can basically rearrange parts of the uh, the code. So things that aren't parallel in the way it's written. If the CPU can see, hey, I can do this because nothing uh, uh, nothing that I'm doing right now is is uh, affecting what I'm about to do later down the line, it can actually move it up and start doing it in parallel. Uh, we have speculative execution, which is kind of linked to the branch prediction where it actually evaluates different paths of execution. And then when it later knows which one was the correct one, it will discard the, the data, hopefully, otherwise we have exploits. Uh, and, and then uh, it will actually uh, choose whichever outcome was the correct one. It's kind of like um, uh, quantum mechanics, where if you if you uh, where you have the observer effect, where things can be in like a state of flux until you actually look at it, then it gives one outcome or the other, sort of the same. Um, yeah, you have caching. Uh, uh, most of you know about that, but it's also an aspect and you have different levels uh, of, uh, of caching uh, and everything is in a single diagram. And the thing is that nowadays physical distance is making even, even more uh, difference than it, than it used to be. So a lot of things are going on in a, in a CPU and it, it's even just looking at a single thread, it has multiple parallel plot lines that will resolve to a, to a final result. Oh, hypothetical, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, it, it also keeps two stories going. When it sees, now I can't proceed on one story, it will switch over and, and do some, some work on the, uh, the second thread, which is basically a completely separate story, but it tries to keep both moving uh, moving along so yeah that was one cpu core uh, we have up to 128 cores just on a single cpu die so that is a lot of parallel plot lines right so the thing is that that uh, you have basically a very very parallel uh, um, CPU, but the thing is that that we think a lot in uh, in uh, in linear fashion in a linear fashion. So that gives some some uh, interesting complexity because when you also look into distributed systems, you even take one one machine and you split it out into uh, into many more. So yeah, multiple CPUs, multiple nodes. And uh, you have remote data to those nodes. You, you have RPC calls going out to uh, other services that are, that are going on. Uh, you want to create some form of, of uniformity with, the, with what you're doing. So you don't want, uh, so you want a uniform behavior from all the servers and everything going on in your, in your cluster. So yeah, there's a little, uh, brain explosion there, because it, it can uh, be overwhelming <laughs> to, look at it, uh, to look at it that way. Um, and yeah, for me, it's, uh, it feels like, uh, like kind of a puzzle when you, you are uh, looking at, at these systems. Um, so nowadays, we have more complexity, more things interacting. Um, we just get more and more data. Um, so it, it's not even like, like uh, uh, you can, the, the hardware scales with the amount of data that you, you get. Um, so basically, uh, sequential execution is not gonna get any, any, any better. So you have tiny increments every year, maybe five, if you're lucky, 10%. Uh, increase in, in sequential execution of, uh, of uh, CPUs. So, and that's been going on for a while. I don't think that's 
like a huge surprise for, 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 for that many of you. Um, but yeah, the obvious thing is that we have to think m in a more parallel way as, uh, as we go. And at least from, from my experience, n the design of what we are, we are working with is now more important than it ever was because uh, to, to get the, all these things going, we need to maybe get a bit out of our comfort zone. Um, but yeah, when we design things, we say a, a lot of traditional, uh, traditional thinking says, hey, do we run first, then, uh, then optimize later? Um, that has been a fairly common um, and don't really think about get get the functionality down first, write your tests, everything, get it deployed, test it out. Um, it the thing is that it gives these linear design systems unless you think um, you think parallelism into the design of, of what you're doing, um, and effectively that also limits your ability to, to do these optimizations, which kind of can get you a V1 that you're stuck with, uh, not because you want to, but because the changing to a different uh, pattern is, is basically a, a complete start from scratch. And we all know in the real world, you, you, you say it's a V1 and we'll rewrite everything, but you kind of tend to get stuck with the uh, with the v one at least for for quite a while. Um, so yeah, optimization starts at the at the top, and and uh, when you think of these, it's not one correct thing to, to do. It's not like a grand idea that that uh, or usually it isn't, but it's it's one thousand small right things that you do along the way as you, as you, as you build it. Uh, of course, you can, you can make things that you can, can fix up, up later, but, but, if, uh, but if the overall picture of, of, uh, of your application isn't, um, it, it isn't feasible to scale, then um, yeah, you, you, you're stuck with it for a while. Um, one of the things I tend to think about with, the, with this is uh, uh, all of you here know the, uh, the Go and the Go compile speed. At least in my mind, that could only happen because from the very first second they, they sat down and started writing the Go compile, the goal was this must be fast. And so even the, the language has some aspects to it that, that are contributing to making go a very, very pleasant uh, compile experience um, because it's one of those things, it can be really, really hard to fix later down the line. Uh, so instead, they, they designed it to be fast and then they actually did the correct implementation when they rewrote to, to, to go, which is more, which of made it slower for a, for a while at least. But the overall framework made it so that it, it didn't actually degrade more than maybe 50% for the uh, for the initial version they uh, they released that was written in Go. So yeah, how do we start to think about this? Um, there's a there's a hint in the, <laughs> the background. <laughs> so um, so yeah, one of the things I I, I love is uh, is to. Uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to watch Formula One racing. Uh, hoping here in Italy that at least someone who, uh, who has the same, same passion as I do. But one of the things that fascinates me a lot is the extreme engineering that goes into this. Obviously it's like, it's like this weird um, bubble of things that goes on because it's, so, it's just a closed ecosystem. They only compete against themselves and it has little real world value i don't care i think it's fascinating to see how they uh, how they 
how they operate, how they think, how they, uh, how they progress, compete against each other, because it's all about um, speed, or at least not only speed, but, uh, but getting across the line first. So there's a fixed goal that's easy to, to see. This is the, the goal, and, and how, do they, how do they get there? Because they've been doing this for, for a long, long time. So yeah, performance reliability, it's not a solved problem, it's a complex system. Every complex system, there'll be things you can tweak and, uh, and uh, make better, uh, which is part of the fascination. The same thing with any software. It's, it's not like there's one correct solution. There, there are solutions that are better, but it's not like every decision has been made when you sit down and, and design things. Uh, have obvious trade-offs. You have the same in, in, in your code. Um, maybe you have some consistency versus performance trade-offs that you, uh, that you are, are working with. But everything has a consequence down, uh, down the line, uh, and, and sometimes it can be, be, uh, be th so the small decisions that you make are to choose the right side of these, uh, these trade-offs. Uh, money helps, uh, both in, in, uh, in racing, uh, without money, it's very hard, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's the same thing here. You, can, uh, you can't just throw people and, and money at the problem and solve it. You, you need to, to have everything work together as a, as a whole. Um, one example is that uh, computational fluids, fluid dynamics is a thing that, uh, that is used, but it's used People think that, okay, that just solves the issue. How do you design a car? You, you do something in, in, in uh, CAD and you put it into a CFD program and it, it'll tell you how to, to fix up. No, 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 no. It's, 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 a, it's a tool that can give you hints towards what, the, what, your, uh, what your design is doing, but it's, it's not like it will just spit out, this is the optimal uh, way to, to, to build a car. So yeah, um, this is uh, Adrian Neu. He's a very famous uh, uh, Formula One designer and uh, has won more championships than anybody. Uh, one of the things I noted uh, hearing a podcast with him is that if you get the underlying architecture wrong, you're, you're stuck with that because as with software and race cars, once you've decided on the overall structure of things, changing that takes time, effort, and, and for, for race cars, it, it's a one year cycle, so they do a new one at the end, end of the year, and they can make tweaks, but if you get the, the very overall theme wrong, then you're stuck with it, and they don't like that. <laughs> they don't like having a slow car for, for, uh, for at least a year. So yeah, um, some part of this is, uh, is uh, building on, on what you think and also what you, you feel is the right thing. Um, an important lesson that always gets, uh, gets mentioned is that if you think that you're more clever than anybody else, uh, then you're probably wrong. <laughs> because there is a reason in Formula One you have 10 teams. If you're the only teams doing a thing, either you have to be really, really, really clever, or they, there's actually nine other people that are saying, this is maybe not the best, best approach for, for, for this. There are exceptions, and uh, you, there's a story of the uh, uh, 1989 Ferrari 640, which uh, had an, uh, an engineer sit in, uh, in England, he was hired for for Ferrari, but he was sitting at the office. He spent a year designing uh, a system that uh, nobody said would, uh, would work. It's, uh, and it basically, it also came down to, he said, hey, if you don't put this on the 89 car, I'm going to quit. <laughs> uh, so he put everything on the line. Uh, you might know it. It's uh, even in road cars. It's the floppy uh, gear shifters because before 89, everybody was doing the uh, old-fashioned shifting, even in Formula One cars, so they were driving down one, 
the straight with one hand and doing gear shifts with the, with the other. Um, but it took a lot of engineering to get to that. It had been tried before, and uh, like 10, 20 years be before, and it didn't work because the technology wasn't ready. So, and, 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 and it just broke down. But, uh, but one year after the Ferrari introduced this, everybody had these, uh, these because it was very, very obvious that you, you could, could steer much better. You, don't, didn't ha you couldn't get into wrong gear. You didn't even have to have a clutch. So it was, it was a, actually a big advantage, but it took a big leap of faith to, uh, to, to actually do it. They had to not only convince, uh, uh, convince uh, people to put it in there, but also have to convince that, hey, if, if this doesn't work, 89 is gonna suck <laughs> because they will have a broken system that is, uh, that is in their car. So thing is, you can't really test it out. You can, you can do small tests, you can drive around a test track, but it's, it's never gonna tell you, hey, what are the big differences that, uh, that this makes? So in, when you're in a similar situation where you feel like uh, uh, this is risky but could give us big, big gains, then spend time with your colleagues. Talk to them, find your most pessimistic, the one who always say, no, no, that's never gonna work and try to convince them. Just take, take time and, and thing is, get the pros and cons listed, listed up and, and just see is this worth taking the, uh, the extra risk for, uh, for this. So yeah, one thing I've learned from, from racing is that, uh, and that also applies to, uh, to programming, you can always go faster. Like, I know it sounds a bit arrogant, but give me any code in a m medium complex system, I can make it faster. And that's just because I've been doing this for 25 years. And I think actually a lot of you also can do it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's more of where do you focus this, um, this effort that you, you put in for, uh, for it? Because you can always go, go, go a, a tiny bit faster, but it's also the, the improvements taper off. So you can, can uh, spend a lot of time doing assembly say, oh, now no, it's assembly, it must be as fast as it is. You can always make tiny tweaks, get maybe one, two percent more. It's a lot of effort for the, for the last. So, so your, uh, your, your improvement curve is, is flattening out and maybe your effort is actually spent better doing optimizations in, in other systems. Um, so yeah, testing uh, and correlating that with, with reality um, yeah, benchmarks is, is the thing that we do. Uh, I tend to say to people that, that uh, your benchmark sucks because it, it shouldn't be artificial uh, benchmarks. It should be something that correlates with reality because you can, you can make very specialized uh, benchmarks that show an improvement in specific cases, but the overall case may be only in improves by a tiny, tiny bit, the entire system, or maybe it's actually worse because it interacts in a, in a bad way with the rest of the, the code. So I tried to put out a few ways of thinking about this. Another thing that, that, uh, that um, made, where I was able to correlate it, so to speak, is a game called, uh, called Factorio. I think it's, um, it's actually, uh, it's almost like you're building a CPU, but as a game. So uh, if you know it, I, I'm sorry. I, it's, it's more of a, uh, you build assembly lines, but where you have different resources that go down uh, assembly lines and you can have factories that combine things and spit out specific uh, output. It is, um, uh, it, it is incredibly close to how you should think about CPUs, uh, and and also people have have used Factorio to to do various um, various program. There's uh, links to where they discuss is Factorio actually are you actually programming? 
people building various stuff in uh, in Factorio. Um, and, and I guess you've also, s uh, a lot of you have also seen building CPUs in, in Minecraft, but this is actually very close because you, you are, um, it also emulates like the physical distance that things have to, to, to move. So you have latency and you have um, being able to separate different signals from each other. Um, actually, it's so close to, it, to me, it feels so much like programming that I, that I don't actually enjoy the game. Like, <laughs> played it <laughs> two times, but but seeing the the uh, the uh, the correlation bit between this is, is actually quite uh, quite fascinating. So so if that's something for you that can actually give you a good picture of, of how to think about uh, about uh, making uh, making things flow, <laughs> so to speak. So yeah, um, how do we speed up our, our, our design? So most speed ups are specializations. So uh, so that is very typical when you uh, when you work, you do a very generic, and then maybe you optimize for some very common scenarios, and you do specialization, and you jump to to this specialized piece of code that will in certain, uh, certain scenarios be, or in most scenarios, let's, let's put it that way, be, uh, be faster for, uh, for your code, but you have fallback for the um, non-common, uh, uncommon, sorry, uh, scenarios that, uh, that are there. Uh, thing about improving speed is that they seem very obvious afterwards, uh, but you could, I, I have code that has lived there for, for in, in my repo for for five years or something, I say that is doesn't get any better than that. And then suddenly something clicks somewhere, and you oh if I do this and if I do this and if I do this, then it might actually. And looking back at the uh, the improvement, it seemed why didn't I do this from the beginning? So so a lot of it is also trying to open your mind to thinking in a in a different way. So very creative, uh, I feel these uh, things are. Uh, of course, focused on proven uh, bottlenecks, um, and and don't, yeah, try to uh, to to see if you can figure out what is what is limiting me uh, me in in this scenario I'm, I'm working on, and since it's go, we have allocations. It's, it's, you have to do it. <laughs> It sucks, but that's that's uh, the curse of Go that we have to to optimize our allocations. Um, it's a wonderful language, uh, and and you can work around these uh, damn allocations. <laughs> so yeah, uh, truly separate your your work. Um, so and and that's I tried to, some pasta. I thought that was like strands and things. Uh, <laughs> The thing is that when you when you design and you think of a system, then try to see what is my single threaded logic uh, bottleneck and try to reduce that down as much as possible. Um, an example, I, I did a, uh, a, um, a backbone grid implementation with, where, where things go through a single connection, uh, messages between servers. Uh, and the um, thing is that, uh, okay, I know I have to stuff everything onto a single connection, um, and, and how do I, uh, so I have these messages that are like serialized data, so okay, let me try to reduce everything related to stuffing things onto a single connection, because I know that that's gonna be a bottleneck at some point, right? So, so instead of sending them the message and having it be serialized in the thread that also writes it to, it's, it seems obvious afterwards, right? That, that hey, you serialize in, in different threads and send the serialized data, but it's like these small obvious things. Think, think what is my single threaded, uh, what, is, what is the story where I can't put out any, any of the paths and do them, uh, do them in parallel uh, anymore? Um, also, when you do 
concurrent work. Um, the longest, so, so concurrent work means that you have a task, you split it up. I had, uh, I, I looked at somebody who, uh, who did a, a ray tracer and he was, uh, uh, so, so he was drawing a, a ray trace picture and he asked the question, hey, if I, when I split this up into four go routines, why is it only twice as fast? It doesn't make sense to me. Uh, and, and the thing is that um, rendering these, uh, these images is not a linear time thing. So, so uh, 20 lines doesn't take always the same time as 20 other random lines. So the thing is, when he splits it up into four, it's the slowest one that gives you the, the wall time of your, of your function. So instead of uh, maybe doing uh, four, just split, draw one line, combine them later. Uh, of course, it seems obvious afterwards. But the thing is, you, you have to, to think about each, each, of the, each of the parts when you split out and merge them back together that the slowest part is actually the one that decides how fast your, your function is. It doesn't really matter that 90% are very fast if there's one that is then very, very slow. So that's the thing to, to keep in mind when you design these. Um, it's not as bad as it used to be, but they used to pop up a lot of lockless uh, implementations of various things. It's not really lockless. It's, it's, it's just doing locks in a different way. <laughs> because when you have to synchronize things across Go routines, then you have to do these expensive operations that uh, Atomics or, or Mutex can also make sense. Uh, but you, you have to synchronize those. It, so they can't make up any lockless magic. So maybe what they do is they have something spinning. So if it fails, it tries again. If it fails, it tries again. And, and you just have things burning CPU instead of actually waiting for, for locks to, uh, to be released. Um, sharding, yeah, you, you, you pr pretty much know that. So if you have the same operation, but, but it's, uh, it's independent of others, you can, uh, can do, uh, do sharding. That's a very, very common optimization. Uh, where you basically say, hey, let's just split it by something, uh, maybe a hash of something that's deterministic or, or whatever, and, and you split it out into two different parts. Uh, and yeah, experiment with how to divide your, your, uh, your work. So maybe uh, try one line, two lines if you're doing the ray tracing. Whatever makes, uh, it's, it's very cheap to spin up Go routines. So generally, as l it's, it's cheap, but it's not free. So it's, it's trade-off, right? So, so you, 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 you need to, to, to have a feeling for what it is, and you try it out, right? Benchmark. Uh, buffers or low latency. Buffering typically allows independent part to work uh, for longer between synchronizing things. But it typically adds latency because, yeah, you're writing to, to or reading from a, from a buffer. So it, it adds latency. And there's a trade-off there. And again, good decision making is that you are aware of which trade-off are you making when you are, you're doing this. Get out of, the, of your comfort zone. Um, yeah, think concurrent. I think uh, I've uh, already covered that very well. Uh, and, and always be aware of the things that serialize your your, your code and make it uh, uh, run as a, as a single thread effectively. Um, follow the code. Go is awesome, right? We can dive into everything and, and basically see what is, what is going on. I love that about my, uh, my IDE, that I can just follow, follow the code down, see what is going on, and, and, and just pick up, pick up stuff there's no huge magic there. Of course, when you get to Atomics, you, you, there's details, right, and, and things that uh, are, are happening. But it's, uh, it's not really, um, 
it's not really not, not magic when you, when you get to it. It's just moving stuff around in memory, right? Um, global state feels good, so having a consistent state feels good, but it's very, very slow because obviously the more you have to synchronize, the more everything has to wait for everything else. Like, but if, if you have a lot of things doing that in, in, in Pella, it might work, but global sales feels good. It feels good that when I put stuff into my database, I get the exact same thing back, but it's, it's, it's a serial operation, right? It's, it's, uh, it feels good because you know that what you're dealing with is correct and you don't have these annoying caching issues where things aren't invalidated and all these, these, uh, these annoying things that, that, that come with not always having a, a global state. Um, yeah, centralized index functions. Uh, of course, any, any index has to some extent be, uh, be, uh, be centralized. Um, but, uh, but yeah, see if what you can get away with not having synchronized when you, when you design your stuff. Some things need to be, no doubt about that, but, but see if you can make, make things um, at a lower level, synchronized at a lower level so you can do it for more items at the, at the same time. User tools, um, I c Go has amazing tools, right? We, we pretty much all know, know that. Benchmarks, I already says, write <laughs> better benchmarks. <laughs> Use real data, right? So, so the, the, the more realistic you can make your, your benchmark, the more valuable uh, information you'll, you'll actually get. I'm, I'm not a fan of, uh, of micro benchmarks where you just test a tiny, uh, tiny function. It can give you an idea, but you, you don't actually get the picture of how it interacts with everything else in your code. So you can have some, some tiny, tiny little benchmark and it'll be 10 times faster, but since your benchmark sucks, everything was predicted by the CPU, so it could just burn through the, uh, the, uh, the micro benchmark and it looks amazing, but when you put in actual values that can't be predicted, then it's actually not as good. So, test it. Yeah, profilers uh, can only recommend it. Understand what the output means, especially of the profilers. It's, um, there's a lot of numbers in the, the box you, you get up with the, this many CPU seconds when it was spent, and that is that many seconds of this. Um, dig into this, this great, uh, this old but still great blog posts that, uh, that give you information about that. Tracing sometimes can give you, um, it can be very chaotic in, uh, in big systems, uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, it can also tell you about dependency that between Go routines that you actually didn't expect to be there. Um, so it's, it's great for that. Disassembler, that's a cheat code. <laughs> if you're very, very low, um, just see if anything makes sense uh, in, in it. I tend to, to write everything in Go and then see if I can trick the compiler into doing something more, more, more clever instead of, because they can keep changing the compiler, but, uh, but there will be trade-offs and, and things uh, that are not op always uh, optimal. Bounce checks, uh, also a, a, a great trick, escape analysis. There are talks out there uh, on, on how to interpret these and how to, to fix them. I'm not gonna go into that detail. It's great tools um, and, and just use them. Yeah, you can check uh, which functions are inlined into others. Uh, and yeah, that's, uh, that's good tools. So a few myths and legends. Oh, that was one too many. <laughs> uh, is that, that branches are always slow. They don't have to be. Um, and uh, uh, so if you're branching on random data, then it is pretty, pretty much uh, given that, that it will take more time because the CPU, again, it can't, it can't predict the, the, the way your story is going, right? So it, it has a diverging path and it has to resolve these at some point. Um, 
Atomics don't actually check all CPUs. Caches know which, um, which uh, values are, are, uh, are valid. So, so Atomics don't actually have to go and ask all uh, CPUs uh, of the, uh, the, uh, the values. I think that's a bit of a surprise for some, but that's an implementation thing. Depends on the CPU, but you shouldn't actually be too afraid of, uh, of, uh, of that, even though they are bad, like anything that is synchronizing, it's, it's to be avoided. When you look at assembler, few instructions is not always faster. Uh, it actually rarely is, because the CPU can, can uh, do more things in, in parallel. So sometimes you can actually hide the cost of certain operations by doing other stuff uh, at the same time. Um, and yeah, memories, uh, memory accesses uh, uh, don't always go to crash. There's, there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of different things. But the TLDR is your CPU is incredible. It can figure out a crazy amount of things and, and actually uh, it does a lot of magic under, underneath that just looking at assembler will not be able to tell you. And sometimes even I get very, very confused of what this CPU is actually able to do and reorder and move things around and uh, delay evaluating things. It, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy what, they, what it's uh, able to do. So yeah, test your, your stuff. Oh. Uh, Test your assumptions as, as uh, much as you, uh, you can go. It should be reproducible. Uh, and I, as I already mentioned, my micro benchmarks can, can very often be, uh, be misleading. So yeah, build your dreams. Keep an open mind. It feels like a puzzle that is falling into place, at least for me when I'm designing things. And it's a it's skill that builds with practice. It's, it's not magic or, or, or anything. I'm not that I'm not clever or anything. I've just been doing this for a long time. <laughs> so, so, so that is basically, um, basically what you can do. So yeah, time for some uh, questions. Is it time for some questions? If you have more, yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the talk. It was yeah. very interesting, also entertaining. Um, I do have a question. You did uh, come up with a metaphor of building a racing car, yes. right? And in a way, wouldn't the architecture of the racing car define your speed limit? So however much you optimize, you will basically get to this asymptotic, as you mentioned, yeah. limit. Um, can that limit pretty much be a local minimum, so it's basically like your architecture binds what you can do, and if that's the case, how do you even recognize such an occurrence? Exactly, exactly. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off uh, often between, uh, between top speed and how fast you can drive around corners with the, with the downforce, because th those are opposites. So, so the, the more downforce you have, the, more, the slower you go down the straight. So it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a trade-off uh, for for that, and and the thing is that that when they get that, uh, they can do tweaks, to, and and that sort of sets the minimum and maximum, but you can't change the overall. Uh, everything uh, affects when you're building uh, when you're building a race car or anything. Everything affects uh, this trade-off and the max and minimum that you can can get from the given architecture, which is like the, the frame of the car. They, they can't change that. It's too big of a thing to, to rebuild everything in, in between each race. So, so it's, it's actually quite similar, similar trade-off. And, and you have the same with, with, the, with software. You can get this close, but it's, you need to, to actually pull out a lot of stuff uh, to get to the, to the next level. Um, and, and being able to recognize that is, is, is not always easy. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for the talk first. And my question 
is how do you respond how fast you respond? Like having something that is super efficient comes from with some trade-off in terms of readability and maintainability. So it, sure. it might be that you need a Fiat and yeah. you don't need a Ferrari. <laughs> that, that's that's uh, that, that's true, and and the thing is that if if you can if you can build out your Fiat, it's not a good picture, <laughs> a metaphor. But if you if you can if uh, if what you're building as the first one can can be extended uh, and and uh, isn't limited then you're you're on the, on the right way hey do don't do all the special specializations all the the uh, very complex stuff but open up so you can shout out to different uh, different servers when the one server you're, you're having doesn't cut it anymore that that's because that can be very hard to add uh, when you suddenly also have other uh, systems uh, uh, basically relying on, on it being uh, consistent in a single table or, or what, whatever you're, you're splitting in into uh, different workloads. Guess this is it. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you.